Hello and welcome to the sixth session of the Green Horizon Summit, when we are focusing on nature and nature-related risk. We are making some progress, I believe, on the issue of energy, clean energy, renewables, part of the revolution in the way that people are thinking about climate. We have yet to reach that level of understanding with nature and biodiversity loss. Today we're going to bring together many of the initiatives that are already appearing in this area to try and make sense of them from a financial markets perspective. Firstly, we will hear from Lord Zach Goldsmith and UNEP Chief Inga Anderson, who will make the case for this study that we're doing here. Secondly, we have a, a panel who will look at the many initiatives that are coming and how we can put them together into a, a framework that makes sense to the financial community. Thirdly, we have a very exciting presentation on carbon offset markets, which will be making, I believe, some very important proposals. And fourthly, we have a conversation with Professor Parthadas Gupta, a leading light on the economics of biodiversity loss. Thank you, Roger. Though I can't join you live today, I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking to you. Were it not for the pandemic, today we'd likely be reflecting on the closing of the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming, and we'd be welcoming the world to the Climate Conference in Glasgow. And that all seems like a different age now, and in many respects, it is. Coronavirus is itself very likely the consequence of our abuse of nature, but we know it will be dwarfed by the impacts of environmental degradation and climate breakdown. Populations of key species have declined by more than two thirds in my lifetime alone. Around a million species currently face extinction. Two out of every five species of plants are now threatened, twice what we thought just four years ago. We've brought the world's great fisheries to their knees, to the brink in most cases, and are destroying the world's tropical forests at a rate of 30 football pitches every single minute. We're losing wonders of the world, medicines, foods, and materials of the future. Now, this ecological catastrophe is an economic calamity as well. A billion people depend on fish for protein. Around a billion people depend directly on forests, including many indigenous people. Invariably, the world's poorest people are hit hardest when the free but hopelessly undervalued services that nature provides begin to fail. But clearly all of us depend fundamentally on the natural world that we inhabit. And whether, whether you turn to the Dasgupta Review on the economics of biodiversity, the Global Commission on Adaptation or Swiss Ray's latest resilience ranking, the news is bleak. For the first time in its 15-year history, the top five places of the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report were filled by environmental risks. So for the sake of people and the planet, turning this trajectory around is objectively the principal challenge of our age. Now, tragically, over a million people have been killed and every single economy battered by this pandemic. But if there's a silver lining to this appalling experience, it's an opportunity to use the urgent need and considerable funds for economic recovery to build back better, greener and cleaner, to do things differently. Now, clearly, that's not just another box to tick. It means making sustainability and resilience the lens through which we map out every decision in our recovery. Now, to some extent, that's already happening in relation to carbon. The cost of renewables has tumbled. Zero emissions vehicles are right on the cusp of going mainstream. The market, in so many respects, is racing ahead of the politics, sometimes in spite of the politics. You consider that coal use in the US fell faster under Trump than it did under Obama. So in December, the UK, alongside France and the UN, will be hosting an ambition summit in partnership with Italy and Chile and asking countries who want to join us to announce new commitments on long-term strategies to meet zero targets, on adaptation plans, and to mobilize at least $100 billion a year for developing countries. But when it comes to attaching a value to nature and a cost to its destruction, we have a very, very long way to go. And that has to change. There is no pathway to tackling climate change or indeed preventing poverty and reversing appalling biodiversity loss that does not involve protecting and conserving nature on a massive, unprecedented scale. Nature-based solutions could provide a third 
of the solution we need to climate change, but it receives less than 3% of the international climate finance. And we've committed not only to doubling our climate finance, but to increasing the share that is spent on nature-based solutions significantly. And we're encouraging others to do similarly. But the task is far too big for public money alone, so we need to mobilise private finance as well. And we need to identify and shift the incentives that drive destruction. The $700 billion in agricultural subsidies paid out by the top 50 food producing countries, for instance. And we're working with the private sector to devise systems for understanding better environmental risks. Through the creation of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, uh, which was chaired by Michael Bloomberg and championed by Mark Carney, we are beginning to understand the risks associated with carbon emissions. And we now need the same global effort for nature. But natural systems are vastly more complex than measuring carbon. And nature-related risks go far beyond climate alone. For example, the risk of flooding increases dramatically with the loss of wetlands and the removal of forests. Food production depends completely on the healthy soils that we are despoiling. So the finance sector struggles to understand environmental risk, and that's why the UK government is working closely with the UN and Global Canopy, WWF, and a working group of financial institutions, governments, and regulators from all around the world to create a market-led task force for nature-related financial disclosures. The market is the most powerful force for change, other than nature herself. But until it applies a value to nature and cost to its destruction, that power will continue to drive destruction. And that is perhaps the single biggest challenge we now face. But facing it isn't merely a choice, it is a duty. But with indisputable facts combined with the need for economic recovery all around the world, and a year in which the world will be gathering to address all these crises together, we have a unique opportunity to turn the tide. So I want to thank you for what you do and wish you well. Let me begin by thanking the City of London Corporation and the Green Finance Institute, as well as the World Economic Forum, for organizing this forum as part of a critical effort to build momentum on green finance. The COVID-19 pandemic has driven home how exposed to risk our economies and societies are. Risks that those of us working in the environmental field have been calling out for years now. At UNEP, we speak of three planetary crises, the climate crisis, the nature and biodiversity crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. These crises are destroying the natural world upon which our economies and societies are built. They're driven by decades of unsustainable consumption and production. We humans have altered 75% of the terrestrial surface of our planet, and we risk losing 1 million species out of 7.8 unless we take action. Climate change continues unabated. The science is clear, and yet we remain unprepared for the shocks associated with these crises. Now, as we continue to deal with COVID-19, we must act harder and faster on the commitments already made. We must make further commitments and take real and meaningful action to stabilize the climate, to protect our natural world, and to stop pollution. Real and meaningful action means moving investment flows away from unsustainable consumption and production patterns, no more financing of coal, deforestation-free food, feed and fiber, a regulatory framework that limits pollution and protects the climate and nature. And all of this requires investment. All of this requires shifting gear in the finance sector, both public and private. The initial stimulus packages in response to COVID-19 rightly prioritized health and keeping companies and people afloat. Now we must look to the future. Over the next six to 18 months, a further $20 trillion in stimulus is likely, largely based on government borrowing. Never before have we seen this amount of public resources being pumped into the economy. We're doing this to save jobs 
and to keep businesses alive. We're doing this for us, but the stimulus debt will be saddled with the next generation to pay off. So we must make smart investments. We must ensure that we do not saddle the next generation with both a pandemic debt and a destroyed planet. That would be an inheritance too impossible to bear. So at this moment, stimulus funds must go towards zero carbon, nature positive and pollution free societies and economies. Public and private finance must fuel that transition on energy, must fund a healthy planet and must fund green jobs. This is a golden opportunity to change track and that opportunity will in all likelihood not come back in generations. It is important to acknowledge that some finance and industry leaders are, have already woken up and are already shifting gear. They're realigning their capital with a future, a green future. Alliances are forming and money is shifting while calls are growing stronger for action all across the industry. This was clear at the UNEP Finance Initiative Global Roundtable last month, where Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, suggested that climate risk should be the criteria for selection in its bond purchase program. And Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, now advisor to the UN Secretary General, argued that the wages of bank executives should be tied to climate objectives. So we're moving in the right direction, but we need to move faster. You will hear that from Sir Parthadas Gupta. But let me just say now that the review that he has led on the economics of biodiversity calls for a global financial system that invests in natural assets. We need trillions of dollars in investments to retool and to green our global economy. Yet financial flows supporting natural assets range from only $78 billion to $143 billion per year, while governments are spending more than $500 billion on support that could harm biodiversity. We at UNEP see four essential actions needed to make sure that we accelerate our action on closing this gap to make every investment count. One, we need to make sure that financial institutions need to start measuring and accounting for the impact of their financing. The finance sector needs to get better at measuring and communicating their impact, both in the positive outcomes of the financing like emissions reductions and the negatives like biodiversity loss or human rights violations. Two, financiers need to set real and comprehensive sustainability targets. Investors need to treat sustainability as a key indicator of portfolio performance, not as a corporate social responsibility effort. Bits of green investments on the fringes of otherwise dirty and toxic portfolios are not the way to go. Entire portfolios and entire organizations need to be consistent with the SDGs and with the Paris Agreement. Two target frameworks that UNEP is pleased to be involved with are the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and the Principles for Responsible Banking. And three, financial institutions need to follow the science. The Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, for example, relies heavily on science to set the timetable for net zero emissions in their portfolio. The Alliance has set clear intermediate targets to realign the portfolio on the way to 2050. Recently, Alliance members announced targeted greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the range of 16 to 29% by 2025. We must make more such science-led action, and we need to see that across the finance sector so that we can convert target into real credible sectoral pathways for ensuring sustainability across the entire finance industry. And four, transparency, and accountability are essential. History has taught us that power often only serves the public good when held to account. We need financial powerhouses to open their books to scrutiny to ensure that they make good on their commitments. The principles for responsible banking, for example, requires third-party review on signatures annual reporting. 
The signatures are establishing a civil society advisory body which allows important inputs from stakeholders that hold them to account. This is the kind of transparency that generates credibility and trust. Following these four tenets will go a long way to move the finance industry in the right direction. But we need every cent to be spent on shifting the needle on sustainability. This is not just because the Earth's beleaguered systems need the finance industry. It's because the finance industry and its future profitability need these natural systems much more. As the Green Horizon Summit makes clear, the green transition is a significant commercial opportunity that can drive job creation and deliver sustainable growth and profits. As we head into COP26, I urge all investors listening to this to think hard on how they can mobilize capital to close the financing gap between the net zero and sustainability ambitions and current reality. Doing so is in everybody's interest. I thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to hearing about your deliberations and following your progress. Thank you. A very warm welcome to our panel, Is Nature the Next Frontier? I'm Helen Avery with the Green Finance Institute, and I'm joined today by four panelists. We have Andrew Mitchell, Senior Advisor at Global Canopy. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Margaret Kulau, Global Conservation Director at WWF International. Martin Berg, Partner at Pollination and David Craig, CEO of Refinitiv. Thank you all so much for joining us for this panel. And we don't have long to convince everyone that nature is indeed the next frontier. So uh, let's just dive in. Um, we'll start with you, Andrew. So for the past, you know, certainly five years since COP21, there's been such a huge global focus and coming together around climate risk. But the E in ESG, as I've heard you say before, has really been a C. It's been about uh, carbon and climate. And it seems like the financial sector is, is getting its head around climate risk and investing for net zero. But this year, in particular, it feels like now that uh, the financial value um, that nature uh, has and the risk of biodiversity loss has been recognised. So you have spearheaded the launch of the task force for nature related financial disclosures, the nature equivalent of the TCFD, the informal working group um, ahead of the task force launched this year. Um, many financial institutions within that group. Were you expecting the level of response you have had from the financial community? Can you tell us a bit more about the TNFD? Uh, actually, I wasn't expecting the response to be as big as it has been. I, I think there is a sort of penny drop moment that's occurred uh, really in the last 18 months on the importance of nature. And this has been hugely accelerated, I believe, by the uh, COVID pandemic because if you ever needed an exemplar of unrecognized nature related risk, uh, that is it. Uh, because it's a tiny speck of nature, it's turned the world upside down, our economies are all over the place and it's affected all our lives. And this has been caused by um, the degradation of nature and deforestation, the illegal trade in wildlife and so on. And this, this is just demonstrating how nature related risk can cut across a lot of sectors. It's big and it's fast. In fact, it's it's now delivering, I mean, governments are having to deliver around about 12.5 trillion in support finance to keep economies going. Uh, and no one expected this to happen. It came completely out of nowhere. We might have thought about plastics in the ocean or, you know, climate change seems slow and lumbering, but this thing came like a rocket. So I think it's really woken up financial institutions uh, to the impact of this and interestingly, central banks as well. And uh, so the, the other thing that's coming along, uh, which is exciting, is there are the inflows into ESG funds. And the idea that you have to sacrifice profits for ESG funds is sort of gradually evaporating. 
anybody who thinks that is probably about 10 years out of date now. And if you look at the inflows into new products like green bonds, green funds, and so on, uh, they're really beginning to not only get big inflows, but they're getting performance as well. So all of these things combined, so that when we put out the idea uh, of having a task force on nature-related disclosure that was, in a sense, a twin of the TCFD, um, we got a lot of people knocking on our doors. So we have 63 financial institutions, governments, regulators, and others now who are working hard on this through an informal working group that started on the 25th of September. And what we're planning to do is to set up the scope and the plan and the resources to launch the task force next year. Uh, it'll have four phases of work, uh, building the framework, the reporting and disclosure framework, testing it, consulting, and then launching it probably in early 2023. And I think this will fundamentally create a sort of systemic change in the way in which uh, the financial sector is going to be initially voluntarily asked to think about its impacts and dependencies on nature and be able to report on it. Of course, this is not easy to do uh, because uh, data is a huge challenge uh, in this sector. There's a lot of data around. Uh, it's not always held by companies. It's sometimes held by governments or academic institutions or NGOs. But one thing is certain, it's not in a form which is decision grade. It's, uh, so therefore, there's a huge opportunity for data providers. And we can see this happening because they're all buying up uh, environmental uh, related uh, kind of service providers. They're all being bought up by S&P and Refinitiv, no doubt, and uh, uh, MSCI and others. You know, it's really... Uh, uh, interesting to see this change. So getting the data right is going to be very important. Getting the regulatory framework right is also beginning to happen because central banks are beginning to pick up on nature-related risk and asking, is this actually a systemic risk in our financial system or not? And the Dutch central bank produced a very interesting report this year called Indebted to Nature, uh, using fundamentally a tool which Global Canopy had produced with UNFFI, the Encore tool. And uh, they're finding $510 billion worth of risk there just in, in the Dutch portfolio that they looked at. So I think there's um, everything to go for. Uh, we're really looking forward to the Das Gupta review, which will be coming out very shortly, which will be looking at nature's stock and flows as assets that underpin our economy. That's going to be very interesting. So uh, I think... Uh, uh, we're really uh, seeing a change in perspective that's happening this year. Yeah, it's been fantastic. And congratulations on um, the launching of the informal working group. We're really looking forward to it. Um, so nature's, you know, not only recognised as a risk, as you've mentioned this year, um, but also there's has been growing recognition of nature as an opportunity. So Martin, coming to you, it feels like a big year for this realisation that nature needs investment. And earlier this year, Pollination and HSBC came together to announce um, a natural capital fund um, aimed at raising a billion pounds to invest in nature-based projects. Obviously felt like the right time. How investable is nature right now to an investor seeking risk-adjusted returns? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, firstly, let me slightly correct you. So what we announced is a joint venture, a joint venture between Pollination and HSBC Asset Management to form an asset management company focused on nature and on climate. Um, and we do think that the, the time is absolutely right for this now. There is really a growing momentum on the investor side, not to only see nature as, an, as, a, as, as a risk in, in, in the way that uh, Andrew just outlined, but also really as an opportunity. So um, I joined Pollination in, in June from the European Investment Bank, um, and um, they are the European Investment Bank. We've been investing in a lot of smaller scale natural capital in, investments. And I always got the same question from institutional investors. And they said, Martin, why can't you, why can't you have um, an investment opportunity that is, that is, uh, that is more sizable? Why? Um, because then we could actually invest. And um, so what we've seen now um, since the launch is really that, uh, that the timing has been um, quite good. There's growing um, interest in natural capital. I, I would argue that COVID to some extent has um, has helped a little bit on this because I think it really um, highlighted the the interdependence of nature, of the economy, and on well. Um, and um, there are also lots of companies out there that uh, that try now to really engage on this. So if you think about for business for nature, 560 companies uh, that that really uh, call on governments to reserve nature laws, over four trillion revenues, or finance for nature, 26 financial institutions, and actually including HSBC. 
with a combined three trillion asset un under management. All of those are looking now in, in, into nature and and, uh, and 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 really want the not only the risks we address, but also mm -hmm. to see is this is this could this be an uh, an investment opportunity? Um, the way we look at this in, in the joint venture, the HSBC pollination joint venture. Is, is really that we, we do think there's an investment strategy built around uh, nature related investments on the core of that we see sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry but also we see many what we call frontier opportunities i.e where for example forestry and agriculture could be um, could could be um uh, could be combined and, and i think the important part now is to really show that these type of investment investments mm -hmm. are actually um something that can uh, be done from a from a, a commercial seeking institution and combine this with impact and the impact part of this um, strategy that that we are looking at is really the important part because we we want to show that it's not only possible to create um, return and impact but in particular it's actually possible to create return through impacts and if you think about regenerative agriculture for example where there are many business models that allow to actually upgrade and increase yield and, and have a much more sustainable yield and thereby also increase the financial return of a project we think this is a, this is a significant opportunity mm. thanks martin um on this sort of point of making sure that you know there's a positive impact, but there's also a return. Um, Margaret, just want to just come to you now. You know, we're obviously recognizing the the risks of nature's destruction, uh, the opportunity for investment, the importance of impact. Um, it feels like at this moment, as governments around the world are focusing on recovery, that this is a chance to build nature into those plans for recovery. Are you seeing this happen? Thanks very much. Uh, nice to see you all. I, I would say sort of. Uh, on the one hand, the stimulus packages that have come so far have not directed funds in a manner that recognizes the potential to build resilience through recovery. And much of the funding has been directed at economic activities that have the potential, in fact, to harm the environment. Uh, the latest green stimulus index, for example, from Vivid Economics and Finance for Biodiversity, shows that there's been almost 13 trillion committed in stimulus funding so far, of which about 500 billion is green stimulus, so-called, and about uh, 93 billion is targeted explicitly to biodiversity. Uh, in fact, that analysis found the announced stimulus packages have a net will have a net negative environmental impact in 16 of the G20 economies. So it's concerning that the packages still don't reflect one of the key learnings, as was mentioned, of COVID, that our own health is intricately tied to our relationship with the natural world. And three to four new infectious diseases have emerged each year for the last 60 years or so, and the probability of spillover has gone up with deforestation and the expansion of agricultural land, intensification of livestock production, and increased harvesting of wildlife, in fact. So the, the World Economic Forum estimates about half of global GDP is either highly or moderately dependent on nature. And almost all aspects of human health and well-being depend on nature. We rely on it for food, for fiber, water, energy, medicines, and Nature is key to everything from climate regulation and water quality to pollination services, flood control, and storm surge protection. Um, I think it's also important to understand in the context of recovery that pandemic prevention is cost effective. So recent research published in Science Magazine found that whereas the cost of actions to prevent the next pandemic maybe on the order of about 22 to 31 billion dollars a year. Um, that would be less if you net out the climate benefits of some of those measures. Even the lowest cost estimate of the disease damage is more than eight trillion dollars and the COVID-19 GDP losses so far are already over five trillion. So leaders are starting to pay attention. Uh, during the UN Summit on Biodiversity in September, uh, political leaders uh, from Albania to Uganda, over 77 countries from all regions of the world, signed something called the Leaders Pledge for Nature. And the first commitment of that pledge, in fact, relates to recovery packages. They commit to uh, put biodiversity, climate, and the environment as a whole 
at the heart of both the COVID-19 recovery strategies and investments in the pursuit of both national and international development and cooperation priorities. So the commitment's there. Now we need to see that commitment translate into a different approach to these recovery programs. Mm. Is there anything to be said about sort of jobs as well, tying into sort of how the sort of nature creates jobs that maybe we're not we're not thinking about enough or talking about enough? Sure, we recently did a, a, some research with the ILO. Um, there are about the International Labor Organization, there are about 1.2 billion jobs in sectors like farming, fisheries, forestry, and tourism. So clearly there is, an, there is a strong opportunity to invest in nature as a way to bring back jobs uh, as part of the recovery. So uh, nature-based solutions, for example, can be very job intensive, re uh, re reforestation, watershed restoration, and uh, as Martin just mentioned, some of these regenerative agricultural um, uh, uh, um, approaches are also very job intensive. So a way to bring back both jobs and the environment. Right. So definitely something to, uh, that we need to embed, as you say, within a recovery. Um, and hopefully that, that is starting to happen. Um, now the elephant in the room perhaps here is the data, as uh, Andrew alluded to. Um, so David, coming to you as our, our data expert, um, we obviously need to be able to measure the risk and measure the impact, positive or negative. So we need financial institutions and governments, regulators um, to so that they can sort of create the policies internal uh, or regulation and metrics that are, you know, as Andrew mentioned, decision useful. Um, in climate, you know, we had the benefit or we have the benefit of having this agreed global scenario of staying with it within a 1.5 to 2 degree increase um, and we have emissions that are measurable. Biodiversity is entirely different. So can you fill us in? Where are we in having the data we need and how do we get to where we need to be? Well, um, I guess the good news is that certainly the appetite and investment in things related to climate and ESG is, is very, very high. And in fact, um, since the crisis, we saw a four to five times increase in the consumption of our ESG data, which we've been collecting for 20 years, and we've never seen the kind of demand that we're seeing now. But I think it was mentioned on the panel that it's it's not really E, it's C, it's very climate based. And in fact, if you look at our data sets, there's very little in there on, on, on um, nature and biodiversity. Uh, in fact, of the 10,000 companies we track, I think 24% declare that they even have a policy. So I think it's very, very early days. Um, and as you say, the good news on climate is, is actually after a lot of work, years of work on standards and um, scope definitions and others, it's quite measurable now. And you can argue the accuracy, the measurability, but the financial market is getting quite used and mature at measuring climate impact and relating it to temperature increase. Um, uh, if you look at our uh, infrastructure database, for example, we track 10,000 um, infrastructure, sorry, 30,000 infrastructure projects, it's worth about $60 trillion. A third of them are in renewable projects and there's increasing appetite in renewable energy projects. So a lot of interesting demand. Uh, the problem is that the financial institutions, and it's really encouraging to hear them signing up to the TNFD, it, it's very early days. Um, there's not that much understanding um, of this topic. Uh, there's very little data that is usable um, industrialized, repeatable. So whilst there is a lot of data swimming around, actually putting it to use is very hard and putting it to use in a repeatable way um, is even harder. So I think this is a multi-year journey. Um, satellite data will play a role, other alternative data sets and monitoring will play a role. Um, but there's a real need for standards, for policies, for frameworks in which this can be measured. Um, so it can be put to use. The good news is that we've been through this with climate, and I think the financial markets have really grown up and matured. Um, the question is, how long will it take on nature and biodiversity to go through the same journey? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, David. So maybe we can sort of switch gears and 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 talk about the pathway forward, certainly over the next twelve months, we lead up to COP, and then and the decade ahead, um, and some of the actions we can take to get the capital moving. So I guess the first, you know, coming back to you, Andrew, the first is, you know, we need to sort of galvanise support and focus. And it sounds like you've done a lot of that already with the TNFD. 
Um, but it can feel a little overwhelming when we start to approach nature. You know, there's lots of strands to it. It's deforestation, it's plastics in oceans, it's agriculture, it's overfishing. Um, is there something we can collectively focus on in this decade ahead to reach our goal of reducing biodiversity loss in the same way that the transition to renewable energy has sort of captured our attention and focus in this goal of reducing carbon emissions? Can we find an equivalent of that story to sort of bring us all together? <laughs> Yeah, well, people sometimes ask me, you know, what's the equivalent of renewable energy in the nature sector? And I think it's probably renewable food. Uh, we need renewable food. We, we're going to see a big shift, I think, of emphasis from fossil fuels to our food system. And the reason is that the food system is the biggest destroyer of nature on the planet, uh, caused by supply chains, which we all need and use in order to provide commodities that we all use to, to make the food we eat. But it's it's become heavily industrialized. It's not looking after the soil very well. And food that we think is cheap actually isn't very cheap because a lot of the costs and non, you know, uh, externalities that are not included in the price of the products that we all use. So, so I think the food industry is going to come under a lot of scrutiny and things like vertical farming are going to create great opportunities, new things like Beyond Meats and so on, and Impossible Meats, all these sort of disruptive factors are going to come into that plus changing diet as well with people not wanting to eat in the same way they've had in the past so i think that it's going to be ripe for opportunity and excitement and uh but of course we've got to look at infrastructure extractive sectors and so on there are about 22 sectors that are the most acutely uh, affected by dependency uh, on nature and impact so they're, they're going to come into the frame here the problem we have there's two things that we've got big problems to solve first of all nature has no number uh, what do we mean by that? Well, it doesn't have a metric like a ton of CO2 where you can measure progress one way or the other. It doesn't have a target like a 1.5 degree target either. And we hope that the CVD will come up with some targets. Uh, so one of the targets is let's protect 30% of the earth by 2030 and 50% by 2050 and things like this. So we need some targets to come out of the conventional biological diversity. And the other thing that we really do need to get to grips with is the impact of subsidies. I mean, all the money that governments are putting in to protect nature are five times less than the harmful subsidies that are being put out to support the agriculture and fossil fuel industry. So, you know, you really can't win. There's no point in even doubling the money that governments are putting in to protect nature in that situation. So these things really are going to have to be tackled as part of this whole transformation of our economic system. Mm. Well, so not... Not too much we have to do, um, <laughs> but, but at least we can sort of start, as you say, sort of focusing down into transition of food um, 30 by 30. There are some sort of big themes that we can sort of bring everyone collectively together around. Margaret, um, so this mention of governments, from the work you've been doing, is there anything specific that you've seen that governments could do to help uh, mobilise capital uh, into nature-based solutions or, you know, or reducing um, money flowing into the destruction of nature. Well, I think to use some of those examples that Andrew just went through, uh, if you look at the uh, evolution of renewable energy, uh, first there was public investment in R&D for new technology. There were uh, public investment incentives uh, and blended finance uh, instruments. We're going to need both of those for biodiversity. In fact, I think for uh, biodiversity, we'll especially need public uh, finance and insurance risk tools in the places where it's really hard to get private finance to flow and public funds are especially tight. And those also tend to be the places where biodiversity may be richest and most at risk. Um, and we'll also need financial tools to scale. I mean, we talked about green bonds. That, that was really the way to get renewable energy investment to scale a number of years ago. And the uh, green bond market was really started by the uh, public sector, public financial institutions. So I think all of those are good examples for uh, how we might think about the same sort of transition for biodiversity finance. And as Andrew mentioned, we need governments to stop incentivizing damage in the first place. So just in the uh, in the agriculture, forestry and fishery sector subsidies that are harmful to nature total more than five hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, and to get to the food sector, there are also significant hidden costs. So the current market value of the global food system is about ten trillion dollars. At the same time, the hidden costs of the global food system 
from things like GHG emissions, food waste, cost of obesity is about $12 trillion. So that means we have a food system right now that's a net value destroyer. So rather mm -hmm. than fund environmental degradation, public funds need to be put in, to work instead to promote a job intensive recovery that rebuilds for climate, for economic, for social resilience. And investment in natural infrastructure like reefs, like forests, like wetlands, they bring climate resilience as well as health benefits. And in some cases, we're talking to the infrastructure sector, um, infrastructure, natural infrastructure like a mangrove, for example, may be a more cost effective way than gray infrastructure for storm surge uh, management. So in short, we need governments to provide incentives for private investment in nature. They need to stop funding and subsidizing harmful activities, and they need to invest in nature for a job rich recovery that builds both economic, environmental, as well as uh, social resilience. Mm, thank you. So, Martin, maybe then coming to you, given uh, that you worked um, previously with uh, the EIB's Natural Capital Finance Facility, um, so you've seen the use of you know, public sector financial support to like, pump prime investments. Uh, you and I have talked uh, at length before about the challenges of building a pipeline so we end up getting um, sizable, scalable, replicable uh, nature-based projects that investors can get behind. Um, you know, do we need more blended finance facilities? To to Margaret's point, how do we start mobilising the capital? Yeah, no, no, thank you. I, perhaps I wouldn't call it pump the prime, but demonstrating <laughs> business models that uh, you know that are feasible. And I think there, blended finance can play a huge role. And, and as you said, that's uh, in my in my prior job at the EIB. That's exactly what we what we've been working on, trying to demonstrate business models, um, helping the, the, the private sector to invest in investment opportunities that they perhaps perceived as too risky, but uh, overall were actually, were actually viable. I think, the, to be honest, as, as usual with all of those things, the, the proof is in the pudding um, in, in the end. A lot of those um, blended finance vehicles are very long-term vehicles, and we will see where, where they lead. I think the one thing, though, I'd like to mention is one one issue I see with with uh, uh, with, with uh, many of the uh, blended finance vehicles is really the scale and the scalability. And I think this is really what we, we ought to now, if they, we want to bring nature to the next level, we have to really think about that. Um, it is it, it, there are, there are quite a few really good examples where um, blended finance has helped um, institutional investors or other private investors um, to, to invest into international related investors. But we also see quite a few examples where, where they get stuck there, i.e. that you always need this public finance in, in order to get the private sector investors in there. And I think in order to reach really scale, what we need to demonstrate is that um, natural capital, nature related investments are actually good investment opportunities. And I think that's exactly we're trying to do now a pollination to see whether in, in, in the fund that we're proposing to really to really go on and saying we have to we have to actually start with the economic return um, and, and and we have to really combine this with uh, with impact and, and and in our view it's actually really possible to 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 create financial return through impact so that's a really important um, an important point of them having said that in particular we, we all know that nature is undervalued um, so there are situations where it's extremely difficult to even demonstrate those bodies. So on individual project level, I think there is still a lot of scope for blended finance to to um, to demonstrate new forms of, for example, payment for ecosystem services, or actually they um, help to create the, the data requirements that larger investors actually have in, in, so that they can invest in the longer term. Mm, thank you. And, and David, uh, you're going to round us up here, I think, in this discussion. Um, and perhaps coming back full circle to disclosures and reporting, what can we do to ensure that financial institutions um, and private sector are equipped, well, the financial institutions really, to equipped to reorient their loan and investment portfolios to sort of become nature positive, if you will, whether that's, you know, assessing risk and, and, and not investing in certain things or putting their money to other things? Well, I think um, to your phrase, nature positive, I mean, helping the financial institutions understand what that means is probably the first step, because if we've heard from this discussion, it's, it's not black and white. There's very many different techniques, technologies, scientific developments. It's different by use of land or geography or area. Um, I do worry a little bit that, that 
the financial institutions might be expected to be the policemen of nature and biodiversity, but it's very hard to be the policeman if the, the laws, the rules um, are very unclear. And, and so we've got to help them on that um, journey. And as I said earlier, it's very, very early days. There's a lot of expertise around, but for the financial institutions, this is early days. I think disclosures play a role, but they're not a silver bullet. Um, I think helping the financial institutions understand through disclosures, particularly at an asset level, um, what's happening in terms of biodiversity and nature focus is, is really important. Uh, disclosures tend to focus on large public companies, though. A lot of the disclosures that are required tend to be the smaller private companies, particularly in emerging markets. So we've got to focus differently, I think, from, from climate. Um, decision grade data. Um, access to data sources such as usability, relevance, land use um, is, is really important. I think governments do have a lot of this data. There's a lot of data trapped in satellite information, um, be it on land or in oceans. Um, I, we shouldn't pretend there's suddenly a magic alternative data source that, that addresses this, but there is data available that could be made more widely available and also industrialized and scaled um, to help it. Um, and materiality, we need to consider what the priorities are and which sectors, geographies or context have the greatest materiality of the risks um, or the opportunity that's there. And I think that can be extremely helpful. It's been a strong debate in climate around materiality. I think some great breakthroughs were made. I think we need that materiality debate um, in nature as well. Um, and then policies, if, if you can you can push for biodiversity and forestation policies and banks, Again, it's helpful, but it's not sufficient, but it's a start. But I think we need to help the financial institutions develop those through either government initiatives or third party sectors, because it's, again, um, it's a specialist topic at the moment. They need a lot of learning and understanding and skills to be help, to help to, to create those kind of policies before they can really become um, effective. So a few, a few things there, it, it's early days. The data is not yet widely available. It, it can be, it needs to be industrialized, but it needs to map the materiality. It needs to map the policies and the rules um, that are set out and it needs to map the priorities of what really matters. So a lot to do, uh, but too much to lose to not just get along and doing it. So I really appreciate all of um, your insights and, and your dedication to, to nature and, and hopefully together you've set this trajectory uh, for the next 12 months and certainly the decade ahead. So thank you so much again for sharing your time with us today. I look forward to continuing to hear your work. Achieving a transition to a net zero economy uh, will require a whole economy transition. That means every bank, every insurer, every investor, every company uh, will need to adapt their business model. Um, and that's why the focus for COP26 is to create a framework for the private financial sector in which every financial decision takes climate change into account. Now, that's a simple objective, but it has a number of components, components covered in other sessions of this uh, meeting on risk, on return, and on reporting. And the focus now is on creating the right markets, mobilization. Um, and there's no more important market than a new market, professional market for carbon offsets. Um, because after all, as companies move to have net zero transition plans, it's exceptionally important that the net in the net zero, the offset, is credible, verifiable, transparent, um, and is preserving, truly preserving, that precious and very limited carbon budget. It also, creating this market, will also create an enormous green investment opportunity, much of which, if not most of which, will flow to emerging and developing economies, bringing vital capital flows and investment at a time when the transition is imperative. But in order for any of that to happen, we need a functioning and professional market. The current market, or markets, for carbon offsets are fragmented. Uh, the verification standards are limited. The data availability is sparse. There's confusion between buyers and sellers. Uh, unstable demand, low, low prices, in fact, very wide range of prices for very similar 
uh, objectives. And so as a consequence, these current voluntary markets struggle with low liquidity and scarce financing. In fact, I think the case for professionalizing this market is made by the size of the market last year, just a little over $300 million of transactions, when these projects should be measured in the tens of billions of dollars per year. So in order to get there, we need to uh, address barriers across the value chain. And that's why the Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets was set up under the sponsorship of the Institute for International Finance and Tim Adams' leadership, um, chaired by Bill Winters, the CEO of Standard Chartered, and the operating lead, Annette Nazareth, of uh, Davis Polk, formerly of the SEC. This is an incredibly powerful and informed and insightful group. Uh, there's over 50 firms from 20 different sectors of the financial sector, including some of the buyers of these offsets, so companies in the real economy, uh, and they're spread across six continents. They've been working hard since September, discussing concrete barriers and proposing solutions to scale up these markets um, and their potential to drive up this critical area of finance. Now, today they've published a report. It's a draft for consultation. It's the result of those months of intensive discussion and generation of potential solutions. I want to thank all the members of the task force and the more, more than 80 members of the accompanying consultation group uh, for providing their time, their expertise, their energy, and their ideas in developing this valuable report. Now, this is a report with a purpose. It is not an academic exercise. It is not going to sit on a shelf. It is going to be translated in the coming weeks into a blueprint for that market, and our intention is to have a pilot market up and running in 12 months' time by Glasgow uh, in November 2021. So the report feeds into action. I encourage all of you to get, all of you watching, to get engaged to help uh, translate uh, these ideas into reality, create this critical market to help conserve our precious carbon budget, to drive investment around the world to move towards a net zero future. And with that, um, I'm going to hand it over uh, to the panel to discuss in more detail. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, uh, thanks very much for that that uh, very, very warm and robust introduction. I think you covered uh, a lot of the ground that we will need to. But uh, before we dive into the panel uh, that Sir Ronald Cohen will be moderating for me and Tim Adams and, uh, and Annette and, and, and with us, uh, I thought I'd make uh, just a few comments to uh, try to expand on, on some of the things that you said. Um, as you pointed out, this is a private sector initiative. Uh, we know that there are uh, multiple government efforts, both individual and coordinated, to address the, the climate problem. Uh, we also know, though, that the, the level of commitments uh, that are being made by many, if not eventually all of us in the private sector, be those uh, corporations, uh, individuals, or, or everything in between, uh, these commitments uh, are, are uh, both robust, uh, they're increasing in size, uh, and in order for us to hit those commitments, and as you said, to, to make the net uh, in net zero uh, effective, uh, we're going to have to have a, a very large, robust, transparent, verifiable carbon market. Uh, and we've, uh, under your, uh, at your initiative, uh, we have set up this task force of private sector entities. You, you mentioned the composition, uh, over 50 uh, global corporations representing all uh, elements of the carbon uh, supply and, and value chain, as well as, uh, as, as NGOs, uh, intermediaries, uh, infrastructure providers, et cetera. But maybe we, uh, we uh, just take a step back and, uh, and, and, and talk about why we need to do this. Uh, I mean, surely the primary focus is, is much of the rest of what we've been talking about at this Green Horizon Summit, which is ways that, that each of us, whether we're corporations or individuals, can reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our emissions of, of greenhouse gases. Uh, and we know just looking at the, at the math, how this works out, uh, that if we all do everything that we think we can do today, it's not enough. Uh, it's not enough to contain the, uh, the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But we need a significant amount of incremental money uh, that will go into uh, outright reductions, uh, further reductions in our carbon footprint and, uh, and sequestration. 
uh, that money needs to come from someplace. Uh, and we know that there have been many investors uh, and, and other savers who have said, you know, we want to put our money into this high impact, uh, high impact requirement. Uh, but the facility to get the money from the people that, that want to invest into the hands of the people that can make a difference through these, in many cases, cutting edge and expensive projects, uh, that mechanism isn't very clear right now. And as, you, as Mark pointed out, uh, the market is, uh, is not transparent. It's not large. Uh, it's not consistently credible. Uh, and we think that the, it's just absolutely essential that the voluntary carbon market fill that gap to make sure that that increment of financing that's required to get us from what we can all do in the ordinary course of our improvements through to the amount of, of capital and change that's required to keep within this 1.5 degree target to make sure that that happens. So uh, how have we gone about this? Well, we've got a, a set of recommendations that we've released today. Strongly encourage all of you to read through those and engage in this process. 52 members from, from around, around the world and across the, the carbon value chain, uh, or over 85 institutions that have provided expert advice uh, and are, are really pressure testing the recommendations that we're making. Uh, we've had some good, healthy discussions about this. There's not consensus on everything, which is why when you read the report, you'll see that there are plenty of questions that are asked about uh, things that, that are still open or things where we uh, would benefit from the views of, of incremental uh, thoughtfulness from, uh, from, the, from the much broader community. Uh, what do we hope that this achieves? Well, we hope that we can achieve a, a consensus on a, a way to get to the, 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 the core foundations of a voluntary carbon market that hits all the attributes that Mark set out in terms of, of transparency, verifiability, credibility, and the like. Uh, of course, there will always be a, a, a call it an over-the-counter market or, or a by appointment market that can operate alongside the core markets uh, that we would like to help develop. Uh, and but, but, but the, the key for the overall market to grow and, and achieve this required level of robustness is to have a, a, core, a core market uh, that is understandable, verifiable, and, and gives uh, a very clear pricing signal. So uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the interplay between uh, public and private sector, but the bulk of, of what you see, virtually all of what you'll see in the report is the role that, that private sector, the private sector can play. Uh, we, we've all made commitments. Uh, my, uh, my bank is, is committed to be uh, net zero by 2030 for our own operations. We know that, that a lot of uh, our carbon footprint relates to the activity of our clients uh, who are producing power or, or shipping or, or, or transporting or manufacturing. Uh, we want to play our role in helping those companies to migrate from higher carbon intensity to lower carbon intensity. Like us, uh, it's unlikely that they can reduce their net emissions to zero. Uh, they will need to go into the market to buy offsets in order to hit their net zero targets much as we can. For this to be effective, uh, we will need to have clear standards. We've got some very crisp thoughts uh, in, the, in the report on how we might achieve that. Transparent data, a robust market infrastructure, an agreed set of financial instruments uh, that can trade on that infrastructure. Uh, these are the necessary ingredients for a successful carbon market. And as you'll see in the, in, the, in the task force blueprint that we set out, we've got six specific uh, areas for action. Uh, first is to identify those core carbon principles and the taxonomy of attributes. So what are the characteristics of the core contract that we want to identify and, and would hope would, would uh, get the market attention to establish a, a liquid, robust, and, uh, and, and transparent market? What are the taxonomy of attributes? By definition, what are the attributes that aren't included in the core carbon contract? Those may be the bases either for future contracts or for over-the-counter or, or by appointment transactions that are done separately, but ideally referencing that core carbon contract, uh, having contributing to the underlying liquidity of this market. Second uh, is that uh, th these core contracts should be traded on a recognized exchange. Uh, they should be supported, number three, by an infrastructure for trade, post-trade uh, financing and data. Uh, critical to the success of, of the establishment of this market is, is, a, is an understandable and, and transparent meta-registry of the things that are supporting these, these core contracts. Uh, number four is a, a consensus on the legitimacy of the offset market. Uh, at times, we've heard people say, please don't focus on offsets, just focus on reduction. The offsets are, are, are a way to cheat to get around the, the carbon commitments that we're making. That's not the way we see it. But rather, we think we can create a carbon contract and, a, and an offset contract that is recognized as legitimate in terms of achieving the purpose for which it was created. That, that it's key uh, through governance structures and through understanding 
that we develop that uh, that, that that consistency uh, and that that uh, consensus on the the legitimacy of carbon offsets. Fifth is the integrity of the market. Uh, so we know that that all markets are subject to abuse or subject to the the uh, the, the shortcomings of a lack of transparency. Uh, we also know that, that markets uh, can be used by uh, by bad actors for uh, illicit purposes. Uh, so we want to make sure that as we build this market, that we're we've got a clear eye on uh, on integrity and the uh, the insur assurance of integrity. And finally, uh, is demand. Uh, you know, while we've all been encouraged by the, the the number of companies that have stepped forward to say that they're going to reduce their carbon footprint dramatically uh, in many cases, uh, we know that the demand for carbon offsets is is still actually lower than the supply today. Hence the 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 price that I think we would all recognize is, is quite low to the extent that you can observe that at all. Uh, so getting that demand drive up and running is, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, now, where are we, where are we here? Uh, we'll take the, uh, the, the thoughts coming back from this consultation paper, and we'll now shift our focus to implementation. So from now until January, we'll focus on, on taking the feedback that we can get through the consultation, developing an implementation roadmap. Uh, we want to uh, ensure that this is more than just a report, right? This is gonna do no, no good if it's just a, a doorstop, uh, rather, uh, we want to cat catalyze uh, future market actors to pursue tangible actions. That means that if you're bothering to listen to this conversation at all, uh, you're intending to, to make a difference in this fight. Uh, to the extent that we can, can uh, coalesce around the, the, the actions that we, the concrete actions that we can all be taking now to scale up this voluntary carbon market, we'll be contributing to our end goal. Uh, and we want to set up a, a committed coalition to collaborate. Right? So this is not a, a, a one firm or one person effort, this, is, this will require the market come, to come together into a common uh, and, uh, and collective area of, uh, of focus instead of, of areas of focus. Uh, so like the, uh, the uh, Task Force for Climate uh, Financing Disclosures, which was uh, an earlier effort led by Mark Carney, that had a, a, a substantially catalyzing effect on the disclosure of, of uh, climate related risks and, uh, and exposures. We would like the, the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets to also have a catalytic effect uh, so that we can have a much greater impact than the sum of our individual contributions to this effort. So the wheels are in motion, things are happening. Uh, we want this to turn into, from a set of ideas to a, a set of commitments. Uh, we're all very keen to get going and actually watch this market grow from the, from the paltry size that Mark mentioned to something in the billions of dollars. Uh, that will get the money into the hands of the people that can really make a difference in reducing our carbon footprint. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Sir Ronald Cohen uh, to lead the rest of this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, panel with you at uh, the summit uh, organized by the City of London, and I'm delighted that the City of London is um, planting its flag firmly in the space because I do think it's uh, the space of the future. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Annette uh, Nazareth, a former commissioner of the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission and a partner at uh, Davis Polk uh, Worldwell, and uh, Tim Adams, uh, the CEO of the Institute of International Finance, who speaks to us from uh, Washington. Uh, and I'd like to just set the scene as I see it. I, I read your report with great interest. And with my perspective as chair of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, but also as chair of the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative at Harvard Business School, um, I have been following uh, your uh, efforts uh, with great interest. The reason, as uh, the previous uh, session before ours um, uh, was saying, the reason is that we are moving towards greater transparency on the environmental damage and indeed the social damage uh, that companies are creating. Uh, the effort I lead uh, or I chair at the Harvard Business School, it's led by George Terafim, a professor of accounting, has already published a data set of 1,800 companies. And if I just illustrate a couple of the conclusions, it sets the scene for the practical discussion we're about to engage in. You can see in dollar terms that these 1,800 companies deliver $3 trillion 
of environmental damage a year. Three trillion dollars, just 1,800 companies. You can see that 250 of these companies deliver more environmental damage in a year than they do in profit. And that a third deliver 25% or more of their profit in environmental damage. So this suggests that as we begin to realize that this impact information is price sensitive, which shows up in the Harvard data, you can see a correlation between greater environmental damage and lower stock market ratings relative to competitors. Regulators are going to have to step in and to mandate the publication by companies of impact weighted accounts that reflect not just their profit, but also their operational impact, their employment impact, uh, and their product impact on people and planet. So we have $3 trillion worth of potential demand for offsets during a transition period, uh, which companies are going to have to uh, go through uh, before they become net impact positive. And so, Tim, if I may ask uh, this question. Uh, your organization has sponsored the work of the task force. Following this work, do you emerge more comfortable that the carbon market can actually play a major role in getting us to bring companies to become impact positive? Sure. Uh, uh, great question, Sir Ronald. Thank you. And it's such an honor to be here with Bill and Annette, uh, good friends and uh, really leading this effort. And I don't know where we'd be without them in the positions they're in. Uh, yes, I think uh, this initiative and others like it can be an, an incredibly important catalyst for intermediating the trillions of dollars of demand that I think is out there uh, that will uh, will develop uh, and uh, become visible over the coming years. I, uh, and it's, it's not only... Uh, uh, the right thing to do. It's also good business for us. You know, our industry, and we represent the full spectrum of financial intermediation, every node across the spectrum is interested in this topic. They see it as uh, they, they're listening to their clients, they're listening to their investors, they're listening to their employees. They see where trends are going. They want to be a part of it. And we see trillions that we want to put to work for a noble and important cause, maybe the most important, if not the most important most consequential issue we will work on in our professional careers. Thank you. And Annette, if I may ask you uh, a question. Uh, you've been a, a regulator and you're very conscious of the inadequacies today of regulation of this uh, carbon offset market. Uh, do you feel that there really is scope to create a transparent and liquid market of real scale here that will be in the billions and even trillions? Well, thank you for asking that question. I think uh, I'm very optimistic about that. I think that we have all of the building blocks for a liquid and transparent market. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about this group that we brought together was we brought together uh, participants from all over the market ecosystem. And as a result, I think we have um, a really wonderful opportunity to build a market that, um, excuse me, I'm having a little connectivity trouble here, so let me just get off that. Um, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, take all, as I said, all the building blocks. So for instance, uh, we have participants from existing exchanges these people obviously know what it takes to, uh, in a, in, to have a regulated market that functions well. We had uh, market infrastructure providers, those who would uh, provide uh, pricing data. We had representatives of buyers and sellers. Um, and, and we had you know, eight participants who would be involved in ratings or, or you know, that kind of thing. So when you bring together all of these pieces and you sort of build a model based on existing vibrant markets. I, I, it makes me very optimistic that this will work. And, and who do you think is going to be the regulator of this, of this market? 
Well, you know, I don't know if we know that just yet. I think, uh, you know, part of the consultation that we're going through, we'll have people sort of recommend uh, who they think could do it. Certainly, I think to the extent that we have not only a cash market, but a futures market, it would probably be likely that an organization like or a regulator such as the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, would be involved. But for the cash market, uh, we'll see. We'll see, you know, what, uh, you know, what existing organizations may be, um, you know, involved and, and could uh, could really help oversee this activity because obviously market integrity is going to be very important. And I know, you know, Bill talked about sort of all the building blocks of uh, and the, the general principles of, of our report, but certainly having uh, a, a market that is uh, not just robust, but free of fraud, has integrity, that's going to be certainly focused on sort of the traditional issues such as AML, um, know your customer type, uh, you know, principles as well. All of those things will be built in. Thank you. Um, and so, Bill, you've been a great proponent of uh, business, and uh, that includes uh, banking and investment, uh, uh, helping government uh, to overcome these um, uh, huge uh, climate challenges uh, that we face. Um, but uh, as, as you hinted in your uh, comments, uh, the way to reduce uh, these carbon emissions is to change the behavior of companies. Uh, governments talking together can't do it on, on their own. How do you see uh, the carbon market interacting uh, with companies and banks and, and investors over the next four or five years to achieve real scale? today? There are issues both of supply, uh, of, uh, of opportunities, of offset opportunities, uh, and demand for carbon offsets. So if you look ahead to uh, four or five years, how, how do you see us actually making progress in scaling up uh, this market? I think that the, the objective has to be, and, and I think we can achieve this objective, to create a virtuous circle. So we, we've started with the, the, the first item in the virtual circle is a recognition that we have a problem. Uh, and I think that's pretty universally accepted right now. Uh, number two is to uh, have companies, uh, or I guess just say broadly emitters, because of course some of the emitters are, are us as individuals as well, but to have us accept that there's a problem and also feel pressure for one reason or other to do our part to address that problem. Uh, I think many of us uh, will act out of a, out of a sense of, of civic duty uh, others will act because their stakeholders have told them that they really want them to act. So, so we've seen that the owners of, of companies, the owners of emitters, have been putting increasing pressure on the companies in their portfolio to take action, to address a problem that we all see. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, I, I think the, the, the corporate world has responded to stakeholders saying, we want you to take action. Uh, in exchange for that, uh, we see that there's money flowing into the hands of, of the, the people who can actually create the reduction technology uh, or that, that can actually remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere through one uh, mean or other. Uh, there's, there's endless good ideas and, and people that would like to do good things that simply don't have the financing. Or, or even if they could get the financing, it's just a little bit too hard and a little bit too slow. Uh, so part of the virtuous circle is, is to congeal the community of, of, uh, of uh, offset creators so that the, the people can get the carbon out of our environment. Uh, to get them uh, out and uh, out asking uh, for their share of the money that's coming out of the, the hands of the people that are being pressured through themselves or others to uh, to uh, to reduce their own emissions or or, uh, or purchase offsets. So as as we get this this virtuous circle going, uh, so far you notice I've not mentioned government, right? But but as we as we get this virtual cir virtuous circle going, uh, we'll have increasing pressure on all of us to reduce our emissions. Uh, we'll have an, an in increasing moral imperative. We'll have improving technology uh, that will consistently drive down the cost of, 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 of offsetting carbon that should lead to a dramatic expansion of the size of the market. Now, along the way, governments will take action. Uh, we've seen very discrete actions from a number of governments, uh, typically on a, on a relatively local basis. And I think like any other market, when you have a state actor that comes in and intervenes in the market, it can have a big effect. Uh, we need to look no further than the, the market for interest rates, uh, where governments and central banks regularly intervene. It doesn't mean the market doesn't function. It means that the market adapts very, very quickly. And I think governments can play an enormously catalyzing role 
uh, or accelerating role uh, through their actions. But we shouldn't wait for that. Uh, the private sector should get its act together uh, and go out there and do the things uh, that we can do today. Uh, and then if the government comes in and, uh, and makes it all a little bit easier or a little bit faster, so much the better. Uh, so as, as we look at what is driving today uh, the effort to tackle climate change, uh, we see that uh, it started off with consumers and employees of, of companies refusing to purchase the products or work for, for companies that were polluting heavily or using child uh, labor. And then the investors became aware of it. And today we see more than $30 trillion of ESG funding flowing to achieve impact as well as profit. We see a trillion dollars this year of impact investment, where you don't just have, as you do in ESG, the intention to create a positive impact on the environment or on society, uh, but you also measure uh, the impact that uh, has been created. So we have more than 30% uh, of professionally managed assets going now to achieve impact as well as profit. And we see at the shareholder meeting a couple of weeks ago of Procter & Gamble, a rebellion by shareholders where two thirds of shareholders vote against management and require information on the deforestation which uh, PNG's use of palm oil uh, is causing. Uh, I think we're going to see these rebellions multiply, both in the environmental, but also in the social area around diversity and economic inequality and, and, and so on and so forth. So how, if I'm right, and if this uh, transparency will be with us within the next three to five years uh, in the form of uh, mandated publication of impact weighted uh, accounts, uh, and, and for those who may not have followed it, uh, just this uh, year alone, we have had IFRS, which is in charge of international accounting outside of the US. Uh, we've had the International Federation of Accountants. Uh, we have had the World Economic Forum. And we have IOSCO, the organization that brings regulators together, uh, talking about uh, sustainability accounting. So this is, this is on the way. The reason I take time to just develop this point, uh, 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 and, and I open the question to the three of you, is we're going to need a massive increase in the offset opportunities that exist. I tried to buy an offset just a, a few weeks ago. The types of opportunities that are around don't really deliver uh, significant environmental impact, many of them. Uh, so how, how are we going to, I know that um, uh, the supply of money creates its own demand, and that over a long period of time, we will see uh, new offset opportunities. But in your work, have you found a way to boost now the supply of, uh, of decent uh, uh, offset uh, opportunities that really have uh, impact on the environment? R R Ronnie, the issue isn't supply. Uh, th there are plenty of projects uh, that, have, that have been tabled uh, that, can, that can get us on the path to one and a half degrees and net zero by 2050. Uh, the problem is financing of those, of those supplies. Uh, th th those projects require money. Uh, we, we put out a report uh, just yesterday and said there's, there's and we, we surveyed the international investors, a $50 trillion question uh, around the, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of financing uh, that's required in order for us to hit these, uh, these targets. Uh, the amount of funding against that $50 trillion of required financing is less than 60%. And if you get into critical regions like the continent of Africa, the available funding is less than 10% of the amount that's required. So what's preventing the, the capital from getting from the hands of all those investors that you mentioned, all the investors that are in our $50 trillion question survey, what's keeping that money from getting into the hands of the African project managers that can actually affect 
the the climate output that we're all looking for? Uh, well, there's a long list, uh, but but one of them is is having uh, exactly the clarity that you talked about when you went out to buy your your carbon offsets personally that that you weren't sure that the offset that you were buying was going to have the desired uh, or intended impact or the advertised impact. So that's why standards are so important. Uh, that's why transparency is so important. That's why having a, a centralized meta registry is so important. Perhaps using blockchain technology or or something like that 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 that, that can add to a sense of assurance. That's why it's not just about at the time that you you purchase the carbon offset, but the way that those projects are monitored over their life uh, to make sure that the impact that was intended at the outset carries on. That's why we're having discussions about whether we should be attaching a lower uh, carbon offset weighting to older offsets. Uh, you know, do these things expire? Do they have a sell by date? I mean, these are these are some of the questions that we've raised. But in answering those questions, uh, we will be making it much more likely uh, that the $50 trillion that eventually is needed makes its way from the hands of the people who are prepared to invest into the hands of the people who are willing and able to invest that capital for the, the climate purposes that we've, that, we've, uh, that we've committed to. But there's a real break in the transmission mechanism between the two. And one critical part of achieving that transmission mechanism effectively is a large, robust, verifiable, scalable carbon market. And when you all think in terms of investors participating in this market, um, is the bulk of the market going to be companies trying to offset the environmental damage uh, you describe and that, that I've described based on the Harvard data? Uh, do you see a role for financial investors to get involved in, in, in this market? be precluded from doing so but don't you think tim i mean i, I should let you speak as well but i, I think uh, certainly i would expect there to be a large institutional component and as you said it's it's certainly going to be a number of large corporations that are not able to get their carbon footprint down fast enough to meet the goals and therefore uh you know will be uh you know purchasing the offsets to to meet the uh you know the the goal the goals of the Paris Agreement as quickly as possible, but um, but I don't think that the uh, participation in this market will be limited to that. And as you say, even as an individual yourself, you've looked for opportunities uh, to invest in in offsets. I'm sorry, Tim, did you have something as well? The, the, the demand is there not only from the corporate sector and will more so over time, not only corporate but small medium sized businesses, but at the retail level, you know you have a whole generation that is coming in to uh, the, the workforce and, and uh, financial capacity, and they're demanding change. And I was, I, was, I was at my favorite coffee shop this morning getting coffee. I thought, what if I, at the point of sale, I could spend an extra quarter or dime that went to the carbon offset for that coffee getting here? It doesn't exist. But we know that the technology companies, the Silicon Valleys of the world, will certainly once inspired and once incentivized will come up with solutions. And we know the demand over time will scale as well. And with that, as long as we have the market mechanisms in place, price discovery and integrity and consistency and good quality data, that, that, uh, that the demand will come. You know, ultimately, and my staff hear me say this all the time, I'd love to see a day when the retail sector, when it's, when it's like food labeling for financial products, that you, when you go buy a box of cereal, you know how much there's sugar and trans fats, and it's easy to compare. Uh, we need the same kind of transparency, simplicity for retail products so that we know what products that we're buying, what is their carbon content. And so that's that's ultimately my dream. How do we get there? But you got to have good data and you got to have the markets that, that we're trying to build. So uh, I think the good news, uh, Tim, is uh, the data exists now. Uh, and I encourage you all to go to the impact weighted account site at Harvard Business School. Uh, where you can see the different environmental impacts monetized of these 1,800 companies. And I agree with you, we are not far, <clears throat> we're not far from the day when you will have an app on your phone and you will point it at the barcode of a product and you will find out how much, uh, if you want to buy a box of Twining's tea in the UK, and you point your phone at the barcode on it, you will discover that Associated British Foods creates $1.8 billion of environmental damage a year against $1.6 billion of profit. 
uh, and you will find out also the environmental and the health impact, as you were saying, saturated fats and uh, sugar content and, and so on, monetize. I think we, you know, we we are really getting close to that technology enables us will enable us to um, to do it. I suppose the the question in all our minds must be if we want to have a, a, a huge increase in the size of this market, what is going to drive it? Uh, and you're all saying we need to create a market that is capable of being a proper market, the supply and the demand. Uh, exists for that market to take off. So all we need to do is to perfect that market. I, I personally uh, agree with you, uh, but is that is that the general view as you've worked on your consultation, or do you have uh, do you have uh, skeptics who uh, who think otherwise? So I don't think we've had skeptics. I think we've had you know, we've been very heartened by the enthusiasm for this. I mean, hearkening back to something that Bill said, you know, said that there's no shortage of supply. I think, I think that's right. I think the problem we've had is the demand signals. There's not been the, the demand for, uh, for the offsets has not been as clear. And I think once we get the transparency around the types of things that you're talking about, I mean, you, we are seeing a groundswell of interest in, you know, in climate change, in, in, you know, carbon, the, our carbon footprint. And if, um, and, and you've talked about what's happening in corporations all over the world where, where shareholders are speaking up and saying that they, you know, they want this to be, um, you know, something that, uh, that the companies that they're investing in um, are, are working towards. And I think that once we bring together um, that information and bring together you know, the demand side and the supply side, I think you're, you know, if we build it, we, as they like to say, they will come. And I think that uh, the timing couldn't be better for this because I think we're going to see a very big pop as we, I, I think you're seeing um, in the interest of, um, of investing in these types of things. I think, uh, you know, I think that demand will be driven by the increasing transparency and right. uh, that uh, like, uh, Procter and Gamble uh, being exposed now on the extent of diversification and having to uh, publish uh, numbers uh, about the extent of it, uh, we're going to find this pressure coming from all different directions. And we have, we have to achieve this uh, transparency sooner rather than later if we want to have real impact on, on, on climate, it seems to me, because we've taken three or four decades uh, for governments to talk to each other, to try to find a solution. But the solution lies in changing the behavior of companies. Uh, in, in, in Bill, uh, when uh, Standard & Chartered is making uh, a loan, uh, having the information to be able to understand uh, whether the company involved is net impact positive or net impact negative and if it is negative then whether it's negative in areas that are going to be risky for for its uh, for its future um, so I, it seems to me that your task force has come at a, at a crucial time when this market really is poised uh, uh, for growth what do you hope to achieve now in the you know in the implementation uh, phase that is coming up, uh, we just have a, a minute left. So perhaps each of you, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Annette. Well, um, you know we're not finished. Uh, as you know, we uh, we worked very hard, and we're very grateful to Green Horizon Summit for giving us this this hard date where we were. Uh, uh, issuing our blueprint, but there's there's more work to be done. I mean, we're we're in a consultation phase now, and we're very much encouraging of uh, all all participants around the globe to uh, you know to engage in our survey and give us uh, their comments. And that that survey is available on the IIF uh, website, and uh, and we we're going to take uh, those findings and uh, those of. Uh, you know, our task force and our consultation group and issue, you know, the final blueprint um, uh, in January. But in addition, uh, we're working on a roadmap now, which is the next steps. And uh, so it's, it's as, 
as both Bill and Tim like to say, you know, we're not doing this report just to sit on a shelf or serve as a doorstop. Uh, we're, we're continuing our work now, uh, you know, towards the roadmap and, and what are the concrete things that we need to do to actually get a market up and running. Well, and that I think you've answered for uh, all the all the panelists. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Bill. Uh, a great uh, panel. Uh, we will leave the last word to Dr. Sandrian, CEO of Conservation International, who's a member of the Task Force Consultative Group. Hello, my name is Sanjan. Uh, I'm the CEO of Conservation International, and thank you for giving me a couple of minutes to speak to you. First and foremost, really thankful and appreciative of the work that the task force is doing and very encouraged by, by recent progress. Look, conservation financing, carbon financing, even though this is a voluntary market, carbon financing is absolutely crucial to scale. Uh, there is no way we are going to even approach some of the targets that have been set by the Paris Climate Agreement if we don't have that scale behind us. And the, and the financing, carbon financing, even though we're operating in this voluntary market, is going to be crucial to it. Now, what's encouraging to me is that there is a hunger, uh, there's a demand by customers, by companies, by private citizens, by consumers, if you will, for carbon projects. Uh, we are, in some sense, constrained really by supply, by high quality supply. And that is the thing that I really want to focus on right now, because yes, the infrastructure, the plumbing, if you will, is crucially important. But what really drives markets, what markets depend on, is confidence. And for us to be able to give that confidence to the market, we have to have high quality projects. We cannot let our guard down. We have to maintain a high bar. We cannot just scale uh, and, and go for size. We have to go for also quality with size, right? So quality becomes really important as well. And what I mean by quality, it means not only being able to derive a return, this we all understand, but it also means having an impact, a positive impact, obviously, on climate, but also on the communities, on people, on jobs, and on nature and biodiversity. Especially in these early days, there's no doubt going to be some bubbles. We will get some things wrong. That's the nature of new markets. However, it's important that transparency, good monitoring and transparency is built into our projects so that when we do stumble, we can learn from it and we are not afraid of owning up to it as a way of continually raising the bar. If we can do that, if we can use the task force, we can use this to really push for impact uh, and build that confidence in the markets, I think this is probably the most exciting thing I certainly, as a conservationist, have ever seen in, in my life and maybe, um, maybe for, you know, forever. This amount of potential support and funding for conservation is extraordinary. But in order to tap that and tap that effectively, we have to get it right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Look forward to engaging further. Partha, hello. We've hello. just heard about the nature crisis being a global challenge and that tackling the twin threats of biodiversity loss and climate change requires to invest more in nature. Partha, you were commissioned by the UK's Treasury to review the economics of biodiversity loss, a huge subject. And may I say it's been a privilege and a pleasure to be working on that review with you. It really has. Thank you. But as your, interview, as your review's interim report made clear back in April, you frame the current nature crisis as an asset management problem. Could you unpack that for us a bit and explain how the concept of nature as a financial asset fits into traditional economic thinking? Thank you very much. Yes, it's, um, I think the best thing to do is to start by asking what we might mean by asset management. And one usually thinks of it as a, of a financier moving fast sums of money around. But I'm thinking of assets here, the review thinks of assets here as, and it's correct way to do it, it is real goods and services, goods in particular. We are look, an asset is a durable good, okay, in contrast to a service. And of course the asset offers services. Uh, and in that, for that point of view, we are all asset managers. 
every one of us, whether you're a farmer, fisherman, whether in Niger or whether you're in China, whether you're in India, or United States, UK, it doesn't matter. Every householder is an asset manager. And we might think of classifying assets, and that's a correct way to do things, uh, thinking of produced capital assets, um, roads, buildings, uh, human capital, education, health. Uh, these are conventional terms now. Even human capital is conventional. But then there is nature, and we now call it natural capital, to bring it in, in proximity to the others. I mean ecosystems, generally speaking, could be mangroves, could be uh, wetlands. Uh, these are real goods, durable goods, which can be uh, uh, tarnished. And we aspire to manage these portfolios of assets, whether it's the farmer or the fisherman, um, as best as they can under the circumstances, given the constraints they face, the scarcity values they observe for them. Now, humanity globally is failing to manage its global portfolio of assets efficiently. We are continually depleting our natural capital, ecosystems like estuaries, forests, and mangroves, in some cases to the point of collapse. And it is important to recognize that it's not about the future only. Poor people in the poorest of countries have observed their own local assets collapse. So we're not talking about unexplained phenomena or anticipated phenomena only. And biodiversity, the subject of my uh, review, is a characteristic of, uh, of portfolios of ecosystems. They make uh, ecosystems productive and resilient. Estimates show that between 1994 and 2014, to give you just an example of how we have tarnished nature, produced that period produced capital per head globally doubled and human capital per head increased by about 13%. This is all re in real terms, okay? But the value of stock of natural capital per head declined, declined by 40%. That's a huge disparity between the directions or movement of the two three categories of assets. A world healthy uh, with a healthy biosphere could choose to draw down its natural capital and use ecosystem services to accumulate produced capital and human capital. That's a plausible scenario. And that is what economic development has come to mean among most economists. But that view and the practices it encourages has meant that in recent decades, humanity's demands have come to vastly outstrip nature supply. It is the definition of unsustainable behavior. So certainly this, uh, this language resonates very strongly with the financial community, Papa, as you, as you of course will realize. We're used to, to thinking in terms of assets and of risk and of commercial opportunity that arises from those risks. And of course the downside that can come too. Clearly the, the, the thinking that you're bringing in here and the thinking that is developing around natural world, natural capital, um, it has, dare I say, almost revolutionary consequences for much of the world because these factors have not been included in the discussion before and because it so clearly implies that one of the problems to be overcome is also a lack of investment both a lack of regard for the value of that asset but also a lack of investment and of course finance is perfectly placed to help with that if we can understand if we can assess and if we can manage those risks and because the mismanagement of asset portfolios also implies opening ourselves up to risk and those risks become material in several different ways for the finance sector through all the different product areas that we're dealing with. Um, as, as the review demonstrates, as, and as we've heard about earlier from Helen Avery's panel discussion with regards to initiatives like TNFD. So in a way, one of the, one of the central pre problems is that nature's worth to society or the value, the financial value of our natural assets, it's not reflected in market prices. It's not reflected in market thinking either. And I think maybe the thinking needs to come before the prices, but can you explain or help us to understand why this is and how we might particularly affect market thinking around the value of the assets that we're dealing with? Thank you very much. These are, of course, exactly, your observations are totally in line with the time we are taking in the review. Um, there are th three features of nature that make nature a very problematic asset in terms of economic thinking. 
One is that nature is always on the move. It's not like a building. You own a building, it stays put. But the wind blows, the rivers flow, oceans circulate, even continents drift. But of course, the time that it takes to drift is very slow, but it has powerful influence over time. So that's one movement, and that makes property rights very hard to define, let alone enforce on those goods. Now, by property rights, I don't mean necessarily private rights, by the way. Could be community rights, could be state rights. A second feature of nature is that it's silent. Many of the processes are silent. Uh, what happens beneath our feet? Uh, you, don't, you don't hear. Um, and yet it's doing an enormous amount of work, uh, which we enjoy the benefits from. A third is that it's invisible. Again, what happens in the soils, you don't observe, but the enormous amount of work is going on. It's like a factory churning out services for us. These three characteristics makes institutions, it's, it's very hard for institutions, and it's not just markets, even the state has difficulty coming to terms with natural capital. As a result, market prices certainly are zero. They're free goods for many, many of the services that we enjoy. I mean, regulating services, I mean, um, carbon sequestration, um, decomposition. These are incredible services that we enjoy silently, invisibly, um, and we don't have to pay for it. In fact, the irony is that we governments subsidize the use of nature in a big way. And of course, that means we're pay paying a negative price. We're being paid to exploit nature. Uh, so we should recognize that we are, there is an undervaluation of nature. And I should say, it's not just the market's fault. States are also at fault. The only institution I know of which broadly speaking recognizes uh, the value of nature are communities, small communities, which live on their local resource base because they can observe what's happening. Uh, and if communities have power, power to adjudicate the use of their local resource bases, threshing, down, uh, uh, threshing grounds, local forest, woodlands, waterholes, then they do manage it. We've got lots of evidence of that from uh, anthropologists' work in third world countries. But on the whole, we are rapacious in our use of nature because it comes for free. Yes, uh, that, that, that sounds familiar. Um, the history of capitalism is one of excellent uh, growth and uh, reduction of poverty. It is also a history of exploitation in one form or another, as we have been, as we, as we are constantly reminded. And I really wonder what future generations will say about our use of natural resources as effectively a free asset. Um, but uh, it's, it's for, me, for me, Partha, as, as, a, as a financier, uh, I, I like to point out that actually financial services are a service. They are, they're, not the, they're, not, they're neither the prime mover in the very beginning and they're very often not the final solu the solution either. But the, 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 the services that we can provide love this language. And I think there's a huge willingness that I hear amongst investors and bankers to address this and to find the right solutions. I also hear a lot from companies, um, our major food companies, our major, our major utilities, our, our, our major traders of, of commodities that want to get this right. But it has to be a global discussion, not a one-off, because as exactly as you say, individual governments need to, need to be speaking the same language and not come from a different angle because it immediately skews the competitive situation. So in that respect, this is a much more complicated discussion than climate. Climate, in a way, we focus on a single metric around carbon, uh, and, and this, you know, the energy revolution that is now happening in renewables is, is, is fantastic. We want to get to a similar situation with land, with land deforestation, with land degradation, with, with the oceans and the like. Therefore, the language here about putting a value and putting a financial um, price on the resources that we're using complex though it is i'm absolutely certain it's it's the it's the way forward as, as your review says one of the one of the one of the conclusions is that we are mismanaging our asset portfolios and i wonder if we could 
move on to talking about how we find solutions to that. What, what, what are the ways in which academe and your study and the, the, the sense of the financial community are basically on side to find a solution? How can we work together with those to find, to find as we've just been discussing in the panel and before, the real solutions to valuing these assets correctly? Well, it has to happen at various layers and it has to hap happen in different various ways. First and foremost, we need to have something like a common grammar for understanding our place in nature. The fact that so much of nature is silent, invisible, and travels, and is as a result free, has made us think that there is no bounds on nature. We may recognize that the biosphere is finite, but we pride ourselves in our ingenuity to overcome that boundedness. We feel it's almost like a fisherman who goes fishing and knows he can take the fish away, home, cook it, eat it, dump it somewhere, and then comes back next, next day to fish some more. We are not external to the biosphere. We are embedded in it. We are part of the biosphere. And that perception, that idea that we, that's, this is our home, will be the first step towards any, any change. Secondly, of course, you're quite right. I have been speaking with financiers and particularly your own influence on the review has been enormous. I don't know if you have recognized that um, because I think we see, think alike on these matters. And of course you have right to be fearful of the future. You have right to worry whether your uh, supply chain is going to cr come cr crashing down because an entire ecosystem 5,000 miles away collapses. You need to have, if you're a financier here, you need to have some notion of what the state of the ecosystems there are, uh, there, there uh, it is out there. Um, the problem is again, as I say, prices are not forthcoming. On the other hand, there are ways of managing assets without having to think about explicit prices. The quality management, you want to ensure that the biosphere is not hurt unduly by the transactions that you're taking, because at the end of the day, it poses risks to you if you don't care about uh, how, how, the, uh, how, the, uh, how the, your activities are, uh, how your portfolio is affecting the activities, the portfolio choice. I think we need a combination of um, a, a cooperation between financiers, governments, and of course, local communities, because that's so much of, so much of the uh, economies of the first world, if you like, the rich countries are built on the primary products of the poor world. Mm. Uh, and there needs to be a genuine cooperation with governments there, communities there, to ensure that uh, the uh, processes are not treating nature there as valueless. Okay. Mm. A third route, but there are many ways of attacking this problem. Uh, they have all to be done simultaneously. We need to describe our economies in the right way. We think of economic progress as income increases, but income is a flow. And when we look at income, say GDP, we look at the gross income, we don't look at net income. We don't take into account the fact that in raising income, you may be depreciating the assets on the basis of which your income is generated. So even if your GDP, a country's GDP increases, it could imply a sinking floor on which you're operating uh, if, you, if you run down your assets. So we need to change the accounting system and move more towards company uh, accounts. Uh, I mean, balance sheets. Uh, national accounts are not balance sheets. They're about income flows, income and expenditure flows. And of course that hides a lot of uh, stuff that's going on in the economy's transactions. So you have to worry about that. Uh, we have to bring these uh, things together. A final point about uh, in the response to you is that we investing in nature 
it's important to recognize that investing in nature can mean doing nothing. We're not, look, we're not in, to interpret investment invariably as people, uh, workers with hard hats, um, digging holes on the ground to lay tarmac. Planting a seed and leaving it alone, with a little bit of nurturing maybe, but the nurturing part is minimal. It's the waiting part, which is costly. So investment here, metaphorically could be, would be wait, do not harm. Leaving alone a woodland is investing in that woodland because it will look better next year. That's extremely important. Uh, and the value of that increase should be captured in your profitability calculations. And you need to be able to do that. If there were ideal prices, of course, it'll, it'll figure in. But even if there are no ideal prices on offer, the agreement between government, civil society, business, communities would ensure that that is protected. And we do that in various bits and pieces. We have protected zones, for example, in the oceans, on land. Uh, why do we do that? Because we've implicitly given a price to it, a high price. Do not touch it. Um, if you're a very uh, in traditional society, is very often bits and pieces of nature, and I use the term not brittle uh, in a, um, uh, and I'm using the term intentionally in economic terms, are regarded as sacred. Well, that's giving a huge value to that object, and preserving it is the equivalent of investing in it, because if you don't preserve it, of course, it gets destroyed. So there are many ways of going about it. The one good, re one really good news, I think, in the post-COVID period, is the fact that, as I say, the nurturing part of nature requires labor. It doesn't require machinery. It doesn't require chainsaws, just the reverse. You don't want to cut down the trees. You want to grow trees. So, it, the, so investment in nature is likely to be, and in fact, there's a deal of evidence, is labor intensive. And that's good news. It means the employment issue is not, it's, there's not going to be a trade off between employment and uh, nature, investment in nature. Um, I think uh, there are other aspects of the problem we could discuss, but I think the a combination of uh, these aspects of accounting, behavior, cooperation is what is needed for us to move forward. Thank you. I think I think Parthi, you've given a new meaning to the to the traditional phrase in asset management of passive investing, which I must say I find very attractive. Although when I think about my own garden and my own few trees, um, it's um, I have to be a bit more active active than that. But I love the idea of letting them just grow, and I think the concept of passive investing applied to nature is is absolutely excellent. And um, Parthi, I'm afraid our time is almost running up, but so I wanted to ask you just a word about the sense of urgency, how we instill that sense of urgency. We've had some fantastic uh, media and film related, uh, we've had David Attenborough's wonderful um, 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 witness statement, uh, in which you also appeared. Um, and I think the, the, to me, there's a, COVID has been a, a stimulus to this discussion. Uh, it's been a stimulus to the idea that we aren't in the right place uh, in many of the ways that we're living, what we're wearing, what we're eating, how we're behaving. Um, what's your feeling about the urgency that's required here? And are you, in the very end, are you optimistic that we will come through and succeed in restoring nature to where it should be? That's a hard one to answer. The first part is easy. Yes, there is enormous un uh, uh, urgency. A state of the environment reports that have been compiled over the past two decades uh, starting with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and more recently IPBS report on the state of the environment is their very sobering reading. Uh, we have really trashed a good deal of Earth uh, in the process of economic development as we, have in, in, as we have defined it in the past. So yes, there's no question about that. What may, can be done? Well, it really depends on us. We are not looking at a government problem. We're not looking at a problem of the market. We're looking at the fact that we, as citizens, 
throughout the world have been extremely negligent. Um, uh, particular, I mean, I can, can't speak for countries outside the, my own experience, but I do have data to show that uh, what might be going through people's minds, which has resulted us into being here. The job is ours as citizens. The one great uh, uh, possibility that I see is the internet. We citizens need, we have access to people we have never met. So it's not just a question of going around within the neighborhood and um, complaining to the local authority. We can reach a much bigger audience. I think the citizens, we need to think of ourselves as citizens when we think about nature. And as citizens, we, for collective security, we need to do something. And I would like the, that the review ends with a, uh, with a, with a uh, plea of two things. One, that the citizens ought to get together uh, directly and indirectly to put pressure on all consent and including pressure on ourselves in our personal behavior. It's not just other people's problems. We ourselves are tarnished. Um, we have to take selfie no matter where we go. Uh, we trash nature even whilst we do that. And the other thing we make a plea for in the review is education. We have to internalize our concerns um, because no institution can protect nature against the assault that we are capable of inflicting on it uh, because of the three properties I mentioned. At the end of the day, we have to be judge and jury ourselves of our own behavior, not of others, obviously. And that can only happen in my judgment if you have some basic understanding of this in infinitely beautiful uh, object we call nature, the processes that are taking place, absolutely mysterious and amazingly beautiful. If you just try and understand it a little bit, you don't have to be a deep ecologist. Um, and if we are educated in, in nature studies from the earliest of our years and it doesn't disappear, then there is a chance that we will come to have an affection for nature, let alone all. And I think at the end of the day, that will be the force that will be required because institutions can't do it all on their own. We have to support the institutions by our own behavior. Partha, Professor Partha Dasgupta, thank you very much indeed for those insights. Uh, I'm looking forward hugely to the response to the review, that which will come out shortly. And I think that we are at the very beginning, I hope, I do believe we are at the beginning of a re revolution the way that we're thinking too about nature and how we use nature and how we value nature. And I'm convinced that the review that you have been uh, responsible for will be a key part in that discussion. Thank you very much indeed for this, uh, for, the, for your insights, and thank you very much indeed for this uh, session at the Green. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure, as always, to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Hi, it's Josh Frydenberg, Treasurer of Australia. It's an honour to speak to you at the Green Horizon Summit. 2020 has been a very challenging year. COVID-19 has resulted in the most severe global economic crisis since the Great Depression. Across the world, hundreds of millions of people have lost their jobs and Australia's economy has not been immune. It has been hit hard. In response, our government has focused on skills and training, tax relief and infrastructure to support job creation. We have focused on the economic recovery from the impact of the pandemic, but also on building a stronger, more resilient country by tackling climate change and paving the way to a lower emissions future. I'd like to thank the Lord Mayor, William Russell, a great friend of Australia, for inviting me to speak and share Australia's experiences on tackling climate change as part of building a stronger economy, and in particular through sustainable financing. Mark Carney and others have done a tremendous job in highlighting the importance of mobilising private sector finance to support the transition already underway across the globe. Climate change is a truly international issue. 
requiring coordination and strong collaboration between the public and private sectors to unlock investment opportunities. We know that advancing the next generation of low emission technologies is crucial to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And realising these goals will require widespread cooperation, including active engagement with the private sector. Australia is playing its part by investing in innovative energy and infrastructure solutions domestically and by joining our global partners to ensure that climate finance is mobilised across the world. The Australian Government is backing new technologies that will create jobs, strengthen our economy and reduce emissions. And as we recover from COVID, Australia's technology-led approach will reduce the cost of new and emerging low emission technologies. Australia's technology investment roadmap will accelerate the development and reduce the price of clean hydrogen, energy storage, low emission steel and aluminium production, CO2 compression, hub transport and storage of CO2, as well as soil carbon. Getting these technologies right will open up new export opportunities and deliver jobs across the country while reducing our emissions. To support the Morrison Government's technology investment roadmap, we have provided $1.4 billion to the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. ARENA, as it's known, seeks to improve the competitiveness of renewable energy technologies and increase the supply of renewable energy through innovation that benefits Australian consumers and businesses. Since 2012, ARENA has supported 566 projects with $1.6 billion in grant funding, unlocking a total investment of almost $6.7 billion in Australia's renewable energy industry. Once low or zero emissions technologies get close to cost parity with the existing alternatives, we know as we've seen with rooftop solar that households and businesses will rapidly adopt those technologies. Of course, it's one thing to have the scientific and engineering expertise to build the technologies of the future, but it's another to finance their development. Working with the private sector to drive down the cost of key technologies is an important part of Australia's transition towards a lower emissions future. Australia is proud to be home to the world's largest publicly funded renewable financing entity, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, or the CEFC as it is otherwise known. The CEFC has made investment commitments of more than $8 billion in new and emerging technologies through more than 160 different transactions and a further 13 co-financing arrangements, leading to investments in projects worth over $28 billion. The CEFC is a great example of what it means to mobilise private sector investment in opportunities that, that are economic but not yet easily bankable. For every dollar the CEFC invests, it mobilises more than two dollars from other investors. Australia's success at being on the front line of renewable energy adoption has been a collaborative endeavour between government, the private sector and most importantly the Australian public. Twins, since 2017, Australia has invested more than 30 billion dollars in renewable energy, becoming the world leader in per capita deployment of solar and wind. One in four Australian households now have solar panels, and in 2019 alone, the share of wind and solar in Australia's electricity grids was more than double the global average, and is projected to rise even more rapidly in coming years. Australia is deploying new renewable energy 10 times faster per capita than the global average and Australia has a history of meeting and beating our international climate emissions targets. We beat Kyoto by 128 million tonnes, and we have also clearly mapped out how we will meet our 2030 Paris target. We recognise that building resilience in the face of climate change is important in responding to natural disasters. And the bushfires we experienced in Australia early this year were devastating. We established a Royal Commission into national natural disaster arrangements and to ensure that we can improve our resilience and adapt to changing climatic conditions. We've invested over $15 billion 
in natural resource management, water infrastructure, drought and disaster resilience, and our overall recovery, which has included $325 billion in further climate science and adaptation research and services. Australia is also focused on investing in climate finance to support countries in our region. We are a steadfast partner in building climate and disaster resilience, particularly in the Pacific, where climate change impacts livelihoods, security and the community's well-being. We will exceed our 2015 commitment of around $1 billion over five years by 2020 on climate development assistance and pledged an additional $500 million over five years from 2020 for renewable energy, climate and disaster resilience in the Pacific. This includes $140 million for the Australian Mobilisation Climate Fund, which will mobilise investments in low emissions, climate resilient solutions for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Thank you very much for your time and the invitation to join with you today. This has been a very important summit and it's a privilege to be part of it.